the winners of the future are not going to be what's worked in the past 10 years, the past 15 years. You know, the, the market generally now has a playbook for if you have an online marketplace, it knows how an online marketplace works. It can see the dynamics. It can value those businesses. So let's look at the places where actually superficially they look different, but, but in reality, we see some of those same underlying drivers of progress being deployed against a, a big new opportunity. So let's talk about the portfolio a bit um, and how you think about the portfolio. Do you think of it first at kind of thematic level or is it all about the single stock? Because it's a very broad space you cover. Um, how, do you, how, do, how, how do you choose the stocks that go into the portfolio? And then we'll talk about how you keep them and all that kind of stuff because people struggle with all of this stuff. Yeah, I think the we we there are some quite strong themes expressed in the portfolio, but we don't start there. We we start with companies and with with individual entrepreneurs, and um, it's you know, it's it's an ex post thing that you start to see these these themes emerging from from investing with these individuals. Um, you know, so so you know if you. If you take the autos industry, you know, do do I think we would be where we are today in that transition to electric vehicles were it not for Tesla? No, I'm I'm very skeptical. I think it's the impact of of a special entrepreneur of a special company that's transformed the industry. So, and and you can have a great hypothesis about a technology or you know a trend that you think is going to be really important, um, but that doesn't mean you're going to get investment returns. Um, and you know we, we've learned this through through hard experience. You know it's uh, investing in Stratasis in the three D printing space, um, investing in China Mobile. You know, it, it, you know as you thought about telecoms. You know, but so so from those experiences, we've gone back saying, what what is special about this company? What is it that's really difficult for others to to emulate? And it's quite unlikely that that's anything to do with today's products or services. It's it's much more likely to come from the way that the company approaches its task, what motivates its people, what the culture of that organization is, why they turn up for work in the morning. And, and we start there. And, and as you build out from that, you start to see some of these, these themes emerge. So what are the bigger bets that you have in the portfolio, whether that's accreted value over time to the portfolio or is something that you're very passionate about talk us through some of the bigger ones and then we'll talk us through then we'll talk through some of the newer opportunities that you've been seeing that you know as you kind of search the landscape so our largest holding is in moderna um which which may be familiar to people as the producer of one of the the major vaccines um that that brought us out of the the, the covid 19 lockdown period um and What's I, I think it sort of exemplifies this idea that um, the, these the technological trends that we've talked about um, can have an impact in in places that that you know we we, we weren't really expecting, um, and so you know, um, drug development has has been to some extent a lottery. You know, if if a healthcare company wanted to develop a new drug, you know, you you would go through this process and. Um, th these things were largely independent. If I've got a molecule that might work at stage one, I have a certain um, probability of success. At stage two, I have a slightly higher probability, stage three, and so on. We think what Moderna has done is, is transformed that paradigm because effectively it's a software business. Um, and But instead of writing in zeros and ones like the Silicon Valley companies, it's writing in the GTs, A's and C's of genetic code. Um, and using this this software it's able to move much more quickly with much lower capital costs and that's what we saw in 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 covid you know the traditional vaccine companies were, were nowhere close to having a, a a product by the time moderna predominantly a software company had had you know, got got to the position of 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 a viable um candidate um and and i think that you you it illustrates an important point about investing, which is the you know the the winners of the future are not going to be what's worked in the past ten years, the past fifteen years. You know 
the, the market generally now has a playbook for if you have an online marketplace, it knows how an online marketplace works. It can see the dynamics. It can value those businesses. So let's look at the places where actually superficially they look different, but but in reality, we see some of those same underlying drivers of progress being deployed against a, a big new opportunity. Yeah, I mean, I... Yeah, I'm predominantly a macro guy. I've grown up in the macro investing industry my whole life. And, you know, my job in that is to live 18 months in the future for an investable time horizon. And then you have secular frameworks that are longer. And this is what people don't understand about technology, which you're alluding to, is you you need to start with today and look at the future and not what the company is. And that confuses the hell out of people because it's a failure of imagination saying, well, what if they manage to get these things right? Where does it go to? I think that's right. And it's so, so what, what that question says is sparks for me is it's so easy, um, to be cynical as an investor, you know, here's somebody else's idea. I can give you 10 reasons why that might go wrong. Um, and I've sat through so many, um, investment debates that, that follow that pattern. Um, but what about if you turn it around and say, well, what might go right? You know, what, what happens if this person is right? Let's, let's think critically, but in the context of upside. Um, and I, and I think that just opens up, you know, a completely new world to you. And, you know, just imagine what could happen. What does it mean if, if, if they do what they say they're going to do, what does that then mean? How big does the opportunity become? Which markets could they attack? Um, and you almost need to go there first before you start to, to enumerate the reasons why it might not happen. Because if they, you know, even if it's unlikely, if, if the payoff is big enough, then that's still a bet worth taking. Um, you know, I, th- I think it was Bezos in one of his shareholder letters said, you know, if you give me a, a 10% chance of a hundred times payoff, um, you know, I, I'll take that bet every time. Um, and so it's, you know, I, I, I think that's an absolutely crucial part of this. You've got to be an optimist and, you know, I, I think that, you know, we go back to being a long-term investor. You know, we've, we bought Amazon in, in 2005. Um, we, we still own shares today, but there was, you know, I don't arrive in the office every day thinking, well, I've owned Amazon for that long. Therefore I must keep holding it. It's because I think it has one of the best risk adjusted upside profiles of any stock I could own. And you challenge that every day. But if you have that conviction, you know, you stick with it. And how do you stick with a stock like Tesla, which does so well? You know, you fight the trend for a while. First, I want to see what you saw in it when you first invested. And then how you hold on to an investment, because that's another thing people struggle with, is you think, oh, I've made some money, I'm going to take profits. But the real game in long-term secular technology investing is keeping hold of the trade. So talk, talk me through the whole Tesla process, because that would be interesting. Um, yeah, sure. So... We, we bought um, Tesla back, I think it was in the autumn of 2030. And what we saw at that point was, you know, here was a company which had produced, uh, uh, designed an electric vehicle, which was getting rave reviews in the motoring press, not as an electric vehicle, but, but it, as, as a passenger car. So, so, so the expert reviews were really good. The company had shown that they could scale production of, the, of, of this product. So 5,000 units a quarter, or whatever it was that they, they were at back then. So you've got an attractive product. You've got a company that demonstrate, has demonstrated they can build it. So for us, it, it wasn't, you know, the technology risk wasn't that high. Um, you know, the, the production risk, the materializing this product that wasn't that high. Um, and so it's him saying, right, well, if this is where we're at, um, you know, actually the, the risks here have declined meaningfully. And at the same time, you know, if the energy density of a battery continues along the trend that it's, that it's been on for some time, um, you know, if, if software continues to get better, et cetera, et cetera, think where this could be five years from now. And it was, it was that combination of ingredients. It wasn't, you know, we know better than anybody else what the what the next battery technology will be or et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then I, and then I think you also have to believe, have belief in the person that that's driving that 
influential individuals are really important in, in this process who have their significant amounts of their own capital tied in up in the, the success or failure of the project um, that have the ability to, to look beyond market cycles. So, so that's what we saw. And then, you know, the endurance, I, so the way I, way I think about endurance is that if you, if you look at your portfolio of stocks today, um, there's going to be a power law distribution of returns. It doesn't matter what the average company in your portfolio does over the next 10 years. It matters what the best two or three companies in your portfolio do. And so the single worst decision I can make as a fund manager is to truncate the, the exponential progress of one of those two or three stocks that are really going to drive all the return. That's the real risk. It's not that I'm too slow to sell something that's not working out, but it's that stock that does 10x or 20x or 50x. And I, I took half the money out because, because uh, you know, it'd be, I, was, I was worried about my business risk because it was too big a part of my portfolio. And so we're just very cautious about, you know, so, so you've got to, you've you've got to think about expected future return, but just because a stock has gone up, it is not more risky. You've got to say, well, how's the addressable opportunity changed, and has the likelihood of success changed? And answer both of those questions, and then look at this, uh, you know, the stock. Because that's the cyclical mindset again. It's gone up a lot, therefore it must come down. Yep. Yes, it it may be cyclical in some respects, but over time it keeps going up if, if the business is right and executing. So what are you really excited about in the portfolio? Stuff you've put in recently and go, you know, this could be really interesting. Where's where where's your tail, upside tail risk in the portfolio now? Yeah, interesting question. It's so, difficult to say it's Amazon because it's not going to go up 50x and it's not going to be Tesla. It's not going to go up 50x. But what what is the 50x you think that you might have? And obviously, we can all be wrong over time, so I'm not holding you to it. We hope you enjoyed the video. At Real Vision, we help you understand the complex world of finance, business, and the global economy with in-depth analysis from real experts. Join the revolution at realvision.com.